Hello everybody and welcome to this very, very interesting video. Um, I wanted to make sure that I give credit where credit's due on this thing. So, um, Mark Kuhar, who only has this video and another video that I'll talk about later on his channel. Um, and it doesn't seem like he's very active um, on here. But he put this thing up that's amazing. And I really wanted to share it with you guys and talk to you about it as we go. Um, and just so you know, this um, this was uploaded in 2018. So we're gonna, I'm gonna give you a little thing here. So poet, critic, member of the rock group, The Fugs, and political activist, Ed Saunders, remembers D.A. Levy and the 1960s mimeograph revolution. Interview courtesy of Larry Smith from Bottom Dog Press. Obviously, you heard a bunch of words in there that are going to pique my interest, <laughs> if you know me. But D.A. Levy is, or was, um, a very influential part of that whole scene. And really helped push a lot of poets in a place that isn't known for poetry, which was Cleveland, Ohio. This is this great... And, Ed Saunders, like, you're going to be seeing a lot more of him because I have some other stuff, like, lined up that I want to talk about. I want to actually try to talk to him. So that's going to be the goal, like, over the next couple weeks to see if I could get some words with him. But regardless, this is a great interview and a great fucking history lesson. So I just wanted to make sure, I mean, Mark has five subscribers and this video is like laced with ads, which is crazy. So that's all YouTube. Go give him a sub. Beginning in 1962, uh, I was involved in New York City in what was called the mimeograph revolution. That is, we were publishing uh, mainly poetry magazines with a pacifist and anti-nuclear flavor uh, on mimeograph machines. There were two or three types, and uh, there was the open drum speedo print, and there was uh, A.B. Dick, and Gestetner made uh, mimeograph machines, which are not made anymore, really. But they had film stencils that you cut with a typewriter or with a stencil, and it was uh, printing a magazine uh, was very affordable, very, very affordable. For like $10, you could publish a poetry magazine and, and give it out or sell it at your poetry readings. So I heard about a guy beginning in about 1963 in Cleveland named D.A. Levy. He had purchased that year a, a, a letterpress uh, in which, with which he was printing these little pamphlets and books of poetry, uh, combining his artwork and, and uh, his very novel and interesting way of putting together pamphlets with different shapes of paper and different colors. And he put his own uh, uh, li line cuts on them and his own artwork. And, and, and then I began be becoming aware of his poetry, and he seemed to be a very interesting poet. So in 1964, he sent me a, a letter uh, asking me if I'd like to uh, s send him a, a manuscript to publish. And he said, um, the wilder the poems, the more I enjoy printing them. So anytime anybody says, send me wild poems, I'd love to print them. So I was overjoyed. I remember dancing around my apartment uh, so in New York City, opening up my file drawers and pulling out a bunch of poems. And, and it became one of his uh, earlier printed books, uh, part letterpress, uh, handbound, called King Lord, Queen Freak, which uh, came out in 65. Then he came to New York City um, to visit. I, 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 hung out with him when he visited some friends in New York City, and he became exposed in New York City to another trend, the coffeehouse movement. The idea of reading poetry aloud in coffee shops was uh, not very common since the 30s or since Vashal Lindsay or most poets did not read uh, in public in bistros. So that introduced 
Levy to the coffee house movement. And I said, sent him a lot of my publications, including we started, Allen Ginsberg and I started at my bookstore, which I, the Psi bookstore, I founded the Psi bookstore in late 64, after I'd already communicated with Levy. And we, Allen Ginsberg lived just down the street. And Allen and I and some others formed the Committee to Legalize Marijuana, the Committee to Legalize Marijuana, and put out a thing called the Marijuana Newsletter, which we sent to Levy in Cleveland. And that unfortunately helped trigger off some of his big problems with the law in Cleveland in beginning in 1965 and continuing virtually up to when he killed himself in the fall of 68. Because he was, a, a, on one level, a, a, a marijuana martyr, much similar to the way that Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters, but particularly Ken Kesey, was hounded by the authorities and threatened and really forced to really almost into retirement. And t uh, 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 Timothy Leary sentenced to prison for, for a really small amount of marijuana. And uh, others, uh, uh, the feds, right around the time that Le D.A. Levy was getting in trouble in Cleveland, the fed federal narcotics agents tried to set up Allen Ginsberg for marijuana arrest. So marijuana was the way to martyr the avant-garde, and Levy suffered that. He wasn't arrested, but they, uh, he started putting out the Mary Jane Quarterly, and then he put out the Marijuana Review, which were, yeah. we know now were really looked with askance upon by, by the uh, officialdom at, uh, in Cleveland. Uh, for instance, they uh, raided a bookstore in uh, December of uh, 1966, uh, and specifically grabbed up uh, the, the marijuana uh, newsletter. And, and uh, there was a big article in January of 1966 on page one of the Cleveland Plain Dealer under the headline, Beatnik Leader Wants Marijuana. So, I mean, like they, they, they used, it was just before hippie replaced beatnik. See, when I went on civil rights marches in the South, they'd call you like beatnik trash or beatnik race mixer. Well, after, by the summer of love, it was dirty hippie. I mean, dirty beatnik was set aside and in came dirty hippie. So, uh, but they were called, say, they were using the headline, beatnik leader wants marijuana. So in dirty, uh, woke 1965, Levy, uh, after all, was 22 years old or 20, just about 23. He was 23 years old. So he was relating to a young, very young crowd of poets as a kind of mentor to his teenage poets and helping, urging him to write poetry. And in the cathedral of a, of the Trinity, in, in, it, there was a coffee shop. They set up a mock beatnik poetry coffee shop in the cathed, in Trinity Cathedral in Cleveland. And someone used the word cocksucker in a poem there and now if it were the sopranos on hbo in 2003 you could utter 150 cocksuckers and add a few other suckers and nothing would happen except people would go for popcorn during intermission so you know so but then it was a big deal so he they that that was uh, so so his association with marijuana beatnik poetry and uh, the reading of possibly obscene poetry in a, in a cathedral coffee shop when added together with, with there was some sort of real estate they wanted to clean up the neighborhood where there were real estate he fell prey to real estate agents worried about the property yeah. values and that hip, beatna, hippies and beatniks and poetry readers and people that advocate the legalization for consenting adults of, of use of marijuana posed a threat. So he attracted the attention of, uh, uh, of a prosecutor named George Moscarino, who kind of hounded him. In early 66, the first issue of the marijuana newsletter came out from Cleveland. At the same time, he was writing this important uh, poem uh, called The North American Book of the Dead, which is one of his more important works. So he was uh, not yet, uh, I don't think he was yet beginning his Buddhist studies. Um, and he, and meanwhile, he'd become uh, a collagist. I have a collage. He had started 
There was also a movement beginning in the, the 60s of, uh, of, of, of putting together collages. So there's Ray Johnson, uh, William Burroughs was making collages, uh, uh, Claude Pelieu was another uh, avant-gardist that was making collages. And Levy, I have collages that he sent me that are they're quite beautiful. So he, he early on became a scissor man, you know, a Matisse man, a scissor man. He was cutting interesting shapes. Then he wrote me in January 65, he says, Have you read The Sacred Mushroom, Key to the Door of Eternity? He goes on to say, It's a Bridey Murphy kind of thing in Egypt. How aware are you of your Egyptianish poems? I am not finished with the book, but turn on like a light bulb cosmic high when reading it. And then he tells me in the same letter that there's a coffee house open, the well. And he said it could be like the Le Metro in, in New York, only in Cleveland. Le Metro was where all the poets were reading to reading. Bob Dylan went there, I went there, uh, Ginsburg would go there, all the beat poets and other poets, would, that's where everybody read on 2nd Avenue in, in 1964 and 65. So he had been to New York and he would picked up on this. So he, he, he says, it is packed, and he says it was opened by a Christian. Everyone says it is unhip to talk about it. What is it? Do you know? In other words, leaving the church and going back to God. So he always had a very highly developed sense of religion. He was very attuned to the cosmos. He had a very sense, a very polished sense of the universe as a living thing. So anyway, so he, he started hanging out at this coffee shop. And, and as I mentioned, that's when we had the committee to legalize marijuana form in, the, in New York City. And there's a famous photo, photo of Allen Ginsberg outside the women's prison in, in Greenwich Village saying, pot is fun. I used to have that pot is fun in my bookstore. I wish I had it. I could put it up on eBay, what, what's it worth, 25 grand? Or if Johnny Depp pays $15,000 for a Jack Kerouac raincoat, hey, Ginsburg's pot is fun sign, we are talking giant. Uh, anyway, so I had, it, so, so he started putting out this marijuana uh, uh, quarterly. And, and, and then I mentioned the, as it went into January 66, uh, DA had, had began to bring poetry to these coffee shops in the University Circle area near Case uh, uh, Western Reserve. And, and the, the, in those days, as I said, the word beatnik had a power to it. Now it doesn't. You know, now it's, it, it's uh, it, you know, it, it's in the culture. But then the word beatnik was charged, like with, was, uh, which could trigger off bliss or anger, depending on the person. So when, when they ran that headline, the Cleveland Plain Dealer in January 66, beatnik leader wants marijuana. I mean, that's like inviting the authorities to come bust in your pad. So and that's basically what happened. Because right, right, after, right around that time, the first issue of the marijuana newsletter came out. And then, but then he began a campaign to put a poetry collection into the Cleveland Public Library. He goes to the Cleveland Public Library and he says, where's all the poetry? And they, he looks at the catalog, and you know where they have they have Robert Frost probably and Edgar Allan Poe, and you know. And so what he does, uh, he puts together a gathering of of poem poets and donates it as an act of goodwill to the Cleveland Public Library of uh, Antonine Artaud, Clayton Eshelman, Diane Wachowski, Jonathan Williams, Charles Bukowski, Kenneth Rexroth, uh, Bob Kaufman, Denise Levertov, Frank O'Hara. Paul Valerie, uh, Charles Reznikoff, Robert Creeley, Charles Olson, Gary Snyder. So he, he put this, he, he gave it to him. So that's an example of his. So he was uh, 23 years old, 24 by then, and was doing these public acts. You know, he was implanting poetry into the coffee shops. He was proposing the legalization of marijuana. He was published, still doing letterpress stuff. He hadn't begun his underground. He was soon to begin an underground newspaper called the uh, uh, Buddhist Third Class. See, third. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, Buddhist Third Class Junk Mail Oracle. Uh, okay, so we go to November sixteenth, nineteen sixty-six. 
and there was a reading at the gate. That's the coffee shop at the basement of the Trinity Cathedral in Cleveland. The police were there. They weren't looking for Eros. They were looking for they were the hounds of pot, who's smoking pot. I mean, it, look, even, even in places where it's legal to smoke pot, you usually don't whip out your uh, bogart. You, you don't whip out your joint in a cathedral. You know what I mean? It's even D.A. Levy. So, so it's not likely they would have had, but, but, but there were poetry reading and voila, the, the, uh, the word, uh, what Monica Lewinsky uh, did to Clinton, uh, near the Rose Garden, a word denoting that act was uttered. And the, and so, the grand jury later on that month, thanks to this prosecutor named George Mascarino, who, who parenthetically, 29 years later, could not remember anything about D.A. Levy. He hounded him in the 66 and 67, but he couldn't even remember his name. He couldn't remember the case. At least that's what he said to interviewers. So anyway, December 1st, so they indicted him for obscenity, for the word. You know, I, I don't think his... I don't think it was his poem. I think it was another kid. I guess he was incited. He incited some teenage boy to use the word uh, cocksucker, you know. So th then there was this uh, Asphodel bookshop, which was run by a, a, a friend of D.A. Levy's, and it was raided. And uh, the, the, uh, they took away nine crates of D.A. Levy's publications, which Jim Lowell had on in storage or on display on the grounds that they might contain uh, advocacy for legalization of pot. So, and Jim Lowell too was arrested. So it was a very uh, strange. So then the, what does the Cleveland Press headline have on January 9th, 1967? Grand jury named beatnik poet in secret indictment on filth. You know, classic uh, Hearst level uh, journalism. So, um, you know, then things went on, and, 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 and then we, we formed a committee, some of us. Allen Ginsberg and I, there was a guy uh, in Cleveland that organized this uh, benefit for, at Case Western Reserve. And uh, the thugs flew out, and Allen Ginsberg flew out. We did a good, good concert, raised, raised, raised all our money. It was for Levy's uh, legal expenses. He was facing time. Uh, you know, he was, Levy, the, the plain dealer described the charge against Levy as follows. Levy is charged with accepting immoral and indecent poetry from the boy and publishing it, as well as reading and distributing it at the coffee house. So the, uh, there were stickers, you know, uh, legalized D.A. Levy, I remember those stickers. So then he was hauled into court on January 17th, and there, there was a very it was a legendary anecdote at the time. The judge uh, says Levy to Levy, the judge, and this is in Cleveland court. He says, "You write poetry, do you sell it?" And Levy said, "I sell poetry for 89 cents a day." And the judge says, "Well, bail of $2,500 is not excessive for a great poet." Maybe you should charge more than 89 cents. So, Levy was uh, <laughs> what we call in the revo recording business, you know, prone to the noise. You know, he was, uh, he, he was, after all, he comes from a very reduced background. He wasn't educated. He told the plane dealer that his parents didn't have enough money to send him to school. He had a high school education. He was in the Navy for seven months. Uh, he graduated from James Rhodes High School in 42, went into the Navy. I, I never could find out what happened, but he's, he, he was out. Uh, uh, and, and, and then, you know, became interested in poetry. And, and, and Jack Teagarden and music and Peggy Lee records. He put out his early books, he described them, listening to all the Jack Teagarden and Peggy Lee and, and, and jazz records. Uh, and so he was just a shy kid, you know? He was just a, part of him was, he was a very skinny, slender, shy. We, he, he didn't like crowds. Uh, he's the type of guy that reveled in close friendships, but he didn't like, 
yet he felt he had to organize. It was all part of him was also bursting out and as, and as an organizer. Up to that point, people who were to be poets in America generally left the Midwest. Hemingway left St. Louis. T.S. Eliot left. Uh, William Burroughs left St. Louis. Everybody, you, they went to the East Coast or to the West Coast. Cleveland, Levy decided, I think it was, it was an act of Cleveland patriotism. He was a patriot of Cleveland. He wasn't going to let anybody drive him out. There was good music, there were coffee shops, there were cheap apartments, there was a university uh, situation, you could get books and records and listen to jazz, there was uh, stuff to smoke, uh, there was the Beatles and Jimmy and Janice and, you know, there was uh, the underground papers which he formed, so he decided to stick it out. But the establishment, real estate interests and uh, the marijuana hysteria and f beat, uh, Fear of beatniks, beatnik phobia, and fear of uh, the counterculture, and the anti-war movement was growing very big. 67, of course, uh, 66, 67, 67, of course, was the uh, great Detroit ri uh, riots. A lot of the city got burned down. Uh, 67 was, uh, uh, you know, the black power had arisen, and there were a lot of, and there was a very, very strong anti-war movement, and. Uh, you know, we exercised the Pentagon that fall, so it was a, there was a big surge, resurgence in America of, of, of radical activism. And Levy was singled out. It's like in 1984, where you pick, you don't, you don't take on a whole group of people. You pick someone like you. You're the enemy. You're the one that did it. If I attack you, then you're a symbol for everybody else, and everybody else will uh, become nice, uh, placid Americans and, and let the war go on. So, but Levy, meanwhile, was... Uh, fearful. He had, he studied telepathy. He believed, you know, he became a kind of this freelance right. Buddhist in a way. But he, he still, one of his last letters to me had a Jewish star on it. So he had a, he was like Allen Ginsberg. He had his remnants of his uh, parental religion mixed in with the uh, religions he was exposed to in the counterculture and also uh, uh, Buddhism. That was awful. We were all flying. You know, it's hard to remember. If you, if you can remember the 60s, you weren't enjoying it. So we, we had decided to have a good time. We came in a very Bacchanalic mode here. The Fogs, we were really, we were on tour and we were, we were in trouble ourselves. We, you know, we were always being picketed by right wing nurses or, you know, the guy would, I, the, the sheriffs, they would be threatening to arrest us. We had to have a, an attorney. Civil Liberties attorney on retainer, so if we got arrested somewhere, we could okay, call him up in the middle of the night and get advice. So it was a very kind of, people don't understand it now, but because there was not the lib freedom of expression that exists now. Then, not of course, now, they bro. just, uh, Lenny Bruce had basically his whole career had been halted because of arrests, not anywhere else but New York City, you know. By this was recorded, I think, in 2004 or 2005. So, um, yeah, so that's a thing. Performing in a Greenwich Village nightclub. So uh, there was a police activity in the lower, uh, remember 67, where, where was the summer of love. And there was massive police activity throughout the country against communes against kids living together, against crash pads. And so there developed a whole system of switchboards and community action centers, and uh, there were a lot of communes forming. So he probably should have gone out, if he'd have gone out to Taos, you know, and joined uh, New Buffalo or, or a reality construction company, or... I know he was headed off for... for uh, uh, California. Anyway, he started a newspaper called the Buddhist Third Class Junk Mail Oracle. And early in 68, he was very, I know he was very afraid of going to jail. He was facing, I think, facing five years. This is for publishing a kid's poem and causing it to be read in a coffee shop. So he was uh, five crazy. years for charge of five contributing years. to the delinquency of minors. So he, uh, 
he pleaded no low contender, which caused a lot of, I think it was part of his guilt, part of his suffering, was he pleaded no low, rather than fighting in court, he was afraid of going to jail. And who wouldn't? In the 60s, you know, anything could happen. He'd wind up being the, the bride of some biker in some prison in Ohio, you know, who would want that? So anyway, he, uh, right after he did that, he sent me his uh, manifesto on uh, prose. It's called Prose on Poetry in the Wholesale Education and Culture System. And uh, I don't have a, the, the little pamphlet here, but I, I know, I remember he sent it to me and uh, it has the lines, isn't that the one that has the lines, uh, you know, where, where he basically says, I thought poetry would be part of salvation and would help save the species. But then he has the line, but the people want blood. Fucking And that, that had defined the last dude. few months of his life. Um, he, put, he was trying to put out this underground newspaper. Now, it was, it was fairly easy to put out an underground newspaper in the 60s because uh, it was it's still very, very inexpensive to print web press, uh, you know, on the big rolls of, of, of newsprint. A newspaper. It's cheap. So he would call it, he, some of his better collages are in the Buddhist third class uh, junk mail oracle. But he also got record ads. You know, what, the, the, the liberal record labels like Reprise and Warner Brothers and, and uh, 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 A&M and uh, Capital and others would run, run ads. And then they would run ads for uh, concerts and then hash pipes, things like that, um, or a thing called orgy butter they were selling. Anyway, he, 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 he sold this stuff, but it, it finally, he, it just, he just couldn't, he couldn't, uh, keep it going, this underground newspaper. And he was really then getting, this is August, September 68. He, he killed himself in the, later on in that same year. So. I, I had seen him. Uh, that was the right, August was the big demonstrate, big uh, police riots at the Demonst Democratic National Convention. So I had been in Cleveland. The Fugs came in there. We used to play uh, Lakov, and Levy would always come to our show, and we'd get him and get him in free. And I wanted him to give me a mantram to send to Chicago, to, to print and hand out to help calm things. Uh, Charles Olson had sent me a mantram and Ed Dorn and others. So I wanted one from Levy, but he was really, um, uh, he just basically told me it was, he couldn't do it. You know, he couldn't send me anything. And, but in August he wrote this 24 page suburban monastery death poem. It's one of his final works and it, and it has a, a threnodic repetitive refrain of of language that is calling out to his friends he has lines like william burroughs rescue me forget that michel ray yael diane rescue me ingrid schwanberg eileen goodson help and then he had the language vajra yogini help papa legba open the gates i don't want to die in ohio anymore and so then he's inscribed the cover of Suburban Monastery Death Poem to Ed Sanders and Kosher Musical Joint for Peace. And he drew a Jewish star in the, underneath the kosher. And it's because in my bookstore, I, it was the, the Peace Eye bookstore was built in an old kosher meat market. And I left the word strictly kosher on the front window with the, with the Hebrew for strictly kosher. And, and then I put Peace Eye bookstore above it. So anyway, he went to Madison now, Madison at that time was what well, could have been a salvation zone for him. I mean, it was a much, a little more progressive. It was, uh, there was a huge anti-war counterculture movement uh, in Madison, and it was receptive. He had friends like Mor Morris Adelson and, is that his name, or Adelman? Adelson? Uh, Morris Adelson, who was... supportive and so they had a, a he was invited to be free university poet in residence in the alternative school associated with the University of Michigan that was a long-lasting alternative school that you know Ken Mikulowski taught at and up until very recently it still existed 
Anyway, he was invited to be a, a teacher. And his course was uh, telepathy, on telepathy. So he didn't feel he had to attend. So his students would come in there and they would attempt to communicate with him uh, from afar by a telepathic uh, vibe exchange. But that was when uh, he did his final artworks then. He did a series. Somebody gave him some Greek, ancient Greek text, which he cut up very beautifully and made into collages. And um, then uh, Nixon came. And uh, right around the time Nixon was elected, very narrowly over Hubert Humphrey, uh, he returned uh, from Madison uh, to Cleveland. He was thinking, I know he was thinking about moving to uh, California. He was a real gritty guy. He hated to be driven away from his hometown. He wanted to hang out. Now it's very easy. Every state has an arts council and every junior college has a slam or a coffee shop or a poetry reading series. So he was a young man who was at the peak of his powers. He was, uh, he had a lot of energy. He was a workaholic. You know, he would print things for people. He very selfless. But I think, you know, without going into a lot of details, I think some, and, and his friends are going to moan and groan, and, and, you know, but I think he was uh, let down by a circle of friends. And I think he felt that you'll have to do research. There are some, you know, he had some love problems. Uh, he had a, you know, very, inter you know, about his whole, I mean, is it, it's the, t the horrible dynamic of the movement where people are naturally inclined to, to pair up as a husband and wife or a boyfriend and girlfriend and live more or less, if serially monogamous, monogamous. But against that urge to live with one person and be true to one person, and it was the 60s uh, sexual freedom and, and the concept of the group group and uh, people sleeping on the floor in a, in a commune and who knows who winds up with whom. And so I think he, he uh, I mean, you'll have to do the research. There are letters he wrote I know about. And so he, he had a tur turbulent love life that I don't think has been explored. Cleveland uh, r really treated him. They ought to, you know, always talking about war reparations. They ought to, uh, you know that nice statue of James Joyce above Zurich? They ought to do a nice poured bronze statue of the slender and handsome young D.A. Levy with a letter press next to him and, and uh, put it in the middle of, down there by, right next to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, uh, old Levy Shrine, because the, the town, the city owes him one. They owe him a, a monument because he could have developed, he had a very refined sense of literature and he was very smart. And he was just, re, it was only, you know, he, he, grew, he was 28 years old. I mean, he, he wasn't 20, he was 26 years old. He was 26 years old when he killed himself. I mean, he was just getting going. Allen Ginsberg didn't write Hal till he was 30. Allen Ginsberg had really not written a lot of interesting poetry, one or two good poems, before suddenly he was sitting in San Francisco and he had this notebook, I saw the best minds, something, 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 and he started typing based on that line and out came a great poem. Levy was just, just warming up. You know, it's like a Pavarotti getting ready to hit a high C. You don't just get up and do it. You, you, you go into action and you have a sacred study period and he didn't have that he couldn't go to college he was he had parents that were uh, both supportive and non-supportive it's like poetry is part oi and part joy the oi the elegy what what's sad and tragic the american tragedy about levy is that he had to focus on oi and could not focus on joy he should have been able to have that oi joy balance and have years where he matured and wrote, he, you know, I just feel he wasn't allowed to write his greatest work. But the work that he did write, there are, there are wonderful sections and wonderful poems. It's as if Shelley had died before he wrote Ode to the West Wind. You know, that's, that's the D.A. Levy tragedy. On November 24th, 
He shot himself in the forehead with his childhood 22, sitting lotus. And once again pled nolo contendere. It's always difficult to make sense of a poet's brief fluorescence. Hart Crane, D.A. Levy, the chaff of genius, blown up above harsh Cleveland. It may take centuries to sort him out. It often does with poets. The issues of economic justice and personal freedom, which wore out the good bard Levy, have not yet been addressed in America. And we need a way that a shyer and yes, even more timorous and fearful genius can flourish their proper span. And Daryl Allen Levy lived not his span, but his poems, the bells of the Cherokee ponies, kibbutz in the sky, North American Book of the Dead, Cleveland undercovers, and a big series of concrete books find their measure. Shine on, O. D. A. Levy, rinsed in the American dream. That was fucking amazing. Like, <clears throat> try to track down as much of him as you can. I mean, he's one of those guys that contributed more to the growth of poetry than he was able to just contribute his own poetry. And he really helped push a lot of people who might not have gotten that kind of push. You know, like... Uh, yeah, 2005, so. Like, I can't stress enough how much of an influence he had. And on top of all of that, the, the other thing that, like, this, I mean, it went into it, but it didn't go into it. When Levy got the obscenity charge, like, that reverberated across the whole country and people like even in LA like like Bukowski and Tchaikovsky and people like that were trying to like help get him like help like get him like enough money to pay for his legal expenses you know because like again we're kind of looking at the same thing right now, but the thing that's different now is that back then, marijuana was illegal. Now, people are trying to silence groups of people based just on political ideology. It's fucking crazy. But, like, the LA Free Press, um, that dude, oh, I can't remember his name right now. Whatever. Like, all of these people, and I'm sure, like, Ferlinghetti and City Lights, like, what happened to Levy, everyone felt and everyone feared. Because if it happens there and it's successful, other places will see, oh, this is how you stamp out this problem. And it just sucks that he just happened to be the guy that this happened to, you know? But at the same time, it kind of solidified him, you know, in his legacy. Because the same fucking thing happened to Ginsburg with Howell, and the same thing happened to Burroughs with Naked Lunch. You know what I'm saying? Like, the controversy made those people larger than life. The problem with Levy was he got in trouble for publication not so much um, or even like recitation not as much his own work you know what I'm saying it's just it's, it's fucking crazy and 
like I have his poems like scattered through different little like mimeos and stuff like that. And if you go on Poetry Foundation, I think there are some of his poems on there. But if you like just go online and search, a lot of people who like were his fans have like digitized a lot of his poetry. Um, and some of it is weirder than others. And when I mean weirder, I just mean like, um, kind of like how Ed Saunders was talking about there about, um, like he didn't say it like this, but I say it like this, but like being haunted by the religion of your family, the religion of your parents. And like, I think it's the same way, like being haunted by the politics of your parents you know, so there was some stuff like that. He dabbled in concrete stuff. He dabbled in a bunch of shit. But, like, I want to try to fucking get, like, my hands on any digitized copies of that um, Junk Mail Oracle newsletter or newspaper he was doing. That looked amazing. Um, the collages on him were great. Um, and I would love to hear what, like... Like, Keith, if you're watching this, let me know what you think of those, man. <laughs> oh, shit. Anyway, like, I just, like, I wasn't going to go away from the USA Poetry stuff right now, but I just feel like this is such an important person. It's such an important period of the mimeograph revolution, the... Um, censorship, the obscenity trials, um, anything like that. I feel like we are kind of right back in those days right now, or very close to them. Like, we're, we're seriously on a precipice, and we could either go one way or the other. The thing with being on a precipice is that if you just take a little step to one side, you just, you, you just fall. And we're in that period right now. And I don't mean to, like, oversell this or try to scare the shit out of anybody, but this is exactly what the fuck's going on. Um, but I think the next... We're going to have some more Ed Saunders stuff, because I could listen to him fucking talk for hours. Like, he's amazing. So anyway, um, I hope you dug this. Let me know what you think down below. Type hard, and I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. Thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew of the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.